most patients assume that if their doctor gives them some medical advice, that that's based on sound, replicatable research. Uh, most people think that if their dietitian says, hey, eat the following things and avoid these other things, they think that that's surely been the result of decades of research studies that, that we've been able to reproduce over and over again, that this has just been proven rock solid beyond a shadow of a doubt because that's the way most doctors and dietitians talk about this science. Well, as you may have suspected, the truth is somewhat less beautiful than that. I've got a, a great guest here today, and we're going to talk about what's wrong with medical research, what's wrong with nutrition research, and then maybe even uh, more systemically, what's wrong with the whole damn system. Uh, I have with me today, Emily Kaplan. Uh, welcome, Emily. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Give us a quick uh, CV on you uh, so that we know kind of where you're coming from with this information. Sure. So I've sort of gone back and forth between working as a journalist. So I got a master's at Northwestern, graduated at the top of my class back when I like to say that journalism was really a rigorous thing. I mean, I joke, mm -hmm. I have a, bad, a master's in science, right? Which sort of seems funny when we look at the way the media is covering things today. But um, that was a long time ago. And I wrote for newspapers and magazines and had columns and um, was a producer at 2020 in primetime where I mostly covered murder, but also did a lot of medical mystery type stuff. I've always really liked complex problems and um, found myself sort of in a position where health just kind of kept coming up. That there's no real training in a newsroom to learn how to do, you know, statistical analysis or any of the sort of back end that you really need to understand in order to report on clinical trials or the medical industry or anything. And I think partly because, you know, pharma has become such a big source for all of us. Um, there was a lot more interest in telling those health stories. We obviously have a lot more sick people than we've ever had before. So that sort of got me into really being interested in like, what's going on here? Nutrition was something I started looking at like 20 years ago. Um, Gary Taubes is a good friend of mine. And when he was writing Good Calories, Bad Calories, I actually went and interviewed him in his apartment in New York with cats crawling all over him. And, you know, I remember thinking, like, if this guy is right about salt and about fat and about all these things, like, we have missed the mark. And how could this be? And so the investigative reporter in me really started digging into those things way back when and has sort of continued. So now Greg Glassman, who um, founded and used to own CrossFit, and I have launched the Broken Science Initiative. Um, which is really geared towards exposing these problems in you know, what we call postmodern science. And medicine is a really great example. So we like to sort of break out that industry science, um, like aerospace, they don't have this problem. Medicine right. has this mm -hmm. problem. So what yep. is the difference, right? These are both scientific endeavors. And yet at the same time, the results are totally different. And so we have spent a couple of years now really diving into what are the symptoms of this problem versus what is the root cause of the problem? And how has it gone so far off the rails? And the truth is, and I hate to start out with such a cynical stance, but I think we both feel very strongly, this is unlikely to get corrected, but the individual can arm themselves with the knowledge and the know-how to right. ask good questions, and chart their own course. And so a big part of Broken Science is we have a medical society, we have a personal health society, um, and we're going to launch in the fall an educator society so that if you want to educate your kids or yourself, um, you know, sort of, again, like looking at these systems as broken, how do we as individuals, knowing that things aren't quite right, but not knowing where to start, have an entry point where we can really get good resources, connect with other people and start building out our own sort of grassroots system. I mean, you know this so well, but you see this in nutrition, right? Like 15 years ago, people thought, you know, sugar, okay, fine. And maybe empty calories, but it's not bad for you. Now we know it's really bad for you. And it's actually very damaging to your system over time. And that that leads to chronic illness. And I think that change, I mean, I give Greta, Greg and Cross, the CrossFit community a lot of credit for that because they're, you know, sort of individual warriors who have this N equals one mindset to everything. And there are enough of them that they started demanding keto products or low carb options. And, you know, I mean, I think even this notion of like Coke and Pepsi switching from saying diet to saying zero sugar 
is a sign that actually we have moved the needle a little bit. Absolutely. Stuff. Yeah. So. And when I started this YouTube channel six years ago, that's exactly was my goal because uh, a good friend of mine, Nina Teicholtz, I don't know if you've heard of sure. her, uh, yep. big fat surprise. She has a lot of connections. She's kind of Ivy League trained. And so her thought was, I'm going to start a coalition and I we're going to work on the FDA and the USDA. And I remember hearing her talk about, about that and thinking, man, good luck with that. Because I don't think I think maybe in 25 years you will have moved the needle a little bit. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to start a YouTube channel and I'm just going to tell people, just regular people. OK, you got type two diabetes, do the following things and it'll get better. In most cases, it'll reverse and go away. Right. And because I, I have no interest in trying to move the needle at the top of the ladder uh, in the ivory towers, because I think that's not impossible. Uh, you, you're an investigative journalist. Now, I want, first, I want to start this conversation by asking you this. Every day in the USA Today or Newsweek or Time or somewhere, some news magazine, we see a new article. Oh, my God, a new study shows that pomegranate juice will make you immortal. Boom, that's it. You're done. You, they're, literally, your health is cured. Just drink two cups of palm juice a day. Now, I want to talk about the report, because typically this kind of research is done at some research in, inst, institute or in, in, uh, university, and then they'll issue a press release once it's peer reviewed and published. You guys, as journalists, get the press release. Is there a, is there a science department at Newsweek or at the New York Times that says, "Okay, give this to the science editor who's got an MA, you know, a master's in science and a PhD in something." And let's crunch the numbers. Let's look at this. Walk us through how that becomes, because their study, the, the title was, uh, there might be some benefit from drinking pomegranate juice. And then the press release says, probable benefits from drinking pomegranate juice. And then the headline at, at uh, the Wall Street Journal says, pomegranate juice gives more immortality. <laughs> how does that work? Well, I think, you know, to be fair, um, I am not working in a newsroom today and haven't for, you know, five, 10 years. Right. So well, even you've been, there. you've been behind the scenes, you know, I, how I have, and I've been in the biggest newsrooms. Right. So I kind of know how the sausage is made. And certainly the, when I was back doing it, there was, I would say a lot more rigor. And I, you know, again, like, I don't want to disparage too unnecessarily what's happening, but I think there are some really important points to make. One is when I graduated from Northwestern and could kind of like pick my way, I worked for a newspaper in Las Vegas. It was the biggest paper in the state. And I was a business reporter and my, I was charged with writing one daily story. And then I would have three weeks to work on a longer feature story. Now that was hard. It was actually quite something to talk to enough people, feel like you got original sources. The rule when I was coming up was that you had to have two independent sources for every fact you put out. So even if it was gas prices, right? Like a release comes out about how gas prices have increased. I've got to find two people who can say like, yep, that's right. Now today that doesn't happen. In fact, it used to be you were not allowed to report off of other news sources. So if the New York Times reported something that could never be a source of mine. I had to go find two people or documents that verified the information. That does not happen anymore. So yes, there are health, I mean, like the New York Times has health reporters, they have science reporters. Do they have the time? I don't think so. I think a lot of the reporters, especially younger reporters, are reporting five to six stories a day. I mean, like they're, they don't have time to dig through documents. They don't have time to educate themselves. And frankly, their editors don't have time to even fact check or push back on them. I mean, the old school newsrooms, especially newspapers, although I would, 2020 in primetime was one of the most competitive jobs in the industry across newspapers, magazines, whatever. We had a lot of involvement from older people who had a lot of experience basically telling us we were wrong all the time. And so we had to prove that we were right. We had to prove it was a good story. We had to prove it was a fair story. We had to prove we talked to people on both sides. I cannot imagine just for the sake of time that people have that, a bit. That I mean, it feels like a luxury now, right? And you add to that, that there's some crazy statistic about how salaries for journalists haven't gone up in 40 years. So you have, I mean, I, like Northwestern was the number one journalism school in the country when I was there. I think there is one person from my graduating class 
who is still in a newsroom doing journalism. You can't have a family and do that. And you get wooed to the sort of PR side or corporate communications. You're paid 20 times what you were making as a reporter. And so it, the whole system is, is not quite right. And I mean, we could talk about why. I think I'm very interested in the finances that go into newspapers. And I mean, part of the reason I focus on newspapers is another thing people don't know is that newspapers are basically like the, the seed for all other journalism. So a daily newspaper reports on something and then you know national news reads. So when I was at ABC, we had morning meeting where there were like 10 of us and we would sit around. We were all responsible for dividing up the country. So I had seven newspapers I would read in the morning. We'd meet at 10 o'clock. We'd pitch stories from those newspapers that we thought would fit into one of the shows. Now, there are not that many local newspapers anymore, right? right. And they're much, much mm -hmm. smaller than they used to be. So the national news, that's their source. And then they'll go and they'll, you know, land like we would fly out and land on the ground and talk to everybody and really develop a longer form story. But if the story wasn't in the newspaper, I don't have people on the ground doing that kind of work. So the whole system has become something very, very different. And content has really become king over quality. So and I think, you know, Fox News and CNN have done us all a huge disservice by having 24 hour news cycle, you don't need 24 hours of news, right? Like give me an hour of really good news about what I need that people have spent all day working on, right? That's not happening anymore. Now it's just like push out as much as you can so that the search engines pick it up. In yeah. fact, I was on a thread um, with a lot of young reporters and one of them was, it's a private thread, right? Of just people who this professor who loved all of us at Northwestern sort of handpicks and this younger reporter who's in a big newsroom was saying they want us to get rid of the dateline. Now, it used to be what, where, when is what goes in your lead, right? Those are the critical facts people need to know. They won't read the whole story. You want them to get the top line. Well, if you get rid of the date and the time, I can read a story and I can think, oh, my God, this ha this is happening. And it could be like from the Vietnam War. Yep. But from the search engine perspective, mm -hmm. those news organizations will get a lot more clicks if it's not tied to a date, because the search engine will see this is older. So right. it won't prioritize it. So a lot it of it evergreen. are getting rid of that. I mean, we don't know what the date is on a story. That's. <laughs> yeah. Every day on Twitter, I see somebody post a news article and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. That. And then I, I, I actually go to the newspaper. It's like, that's from two years ago. Yes. Okay. Well, that doesn't really help me because I'm trying to see what's going on now. So. Is it fair to say that the average reporter uh, working at these new sites is either brand new and hasn't built up their credibility yet, or they're bottom of the barrel, they can't find one of the public sector job or private sector jobs that pays 10, 20 times as much, uh, or uh, some third option I can't think of? Well, I think that's more negative than I would be about it. I think like a lot of the people who are going into this are doing it for the right reasons. Like they want to tell truth to power, but it's an ecosystem. And if you don't have those older people saying like, wait a minute, like I know you're all caught up in this and socially this is a big thing or it's something fancy or exciting or sexy in our zeitgeist, but have you checked it out? And how have you checked it out? And do you know about this earlier study or thing that would rebut that? And a younger reporter is gonna say no. And like, it is really easy to get caught up and get excited. I mean, in crime, this happened all the time. You'd get caught up in something and you'd be like, oh my God, the guy totally did it. But then you'd spend time with the detectives and you'd realize like, this is not as close case as everybody wants it to be. And one of the big things we talk about at Broken Science is this notion of predictable predictability and, and sort of predictable outcomes. And part of that is uncertainty. And so I think we are living through a moment. I think the human brain really, really craves certainty. It's security, yeah. control, right? It's all of these really innate things that make us feel safe. But the world is really uncertain and science is incredibly uncertain, right? Medical yeah. outcomes, like, mm -hmm. I mean, you look at all these nutrition trials that were, you know, epidemiological that didn't actually test anything on anyone, that they were cherry picking data points and then creating causal claim from that. That to me is really symptomatic of this desire for certainty. And that happens in a newsroom too, right? People want to be certain of what they're saying. Really good. I mean, we've 
also sort of commingled this idea of analysis versus news. So we have so much commentary. I mean, I can't open the New York Times today and read a news story yep. that isn't giving me a lot of adjectives and things that my editors would have crossed out. And they would have said, why are you editorializing this? This is a news, just give the facts. Let the reader decide. That doesn't happen anymore. I and wish there were a newspaper somewhere on planet Earth that was still careful with its adjectives because I can't find one. Literally, I every morning over coffee, I probably look at headlines, front pages from at least 20 different newspapers all around the world. Uh, France 24, the, the Times in London, the everybody. It's all opinion. It's all opinion. Now, everybody watching, we've got almost 800 people watching. We're going to start going into to medical research, nutrition research. So if you haven't already done so, please hit the share button and share this out because I promise you. Uh, also, share it with your doctor or dietitian because we're going to be talking about stuff that they do, they're not aware of. I promise you that. One of the things when I first started talking about diet, Emily, uh, proper human diet, keto, ketovore, carnivore, paleo, low carb, is that when we would have a physicist who would, he had had a heart event, right? Or something, oh, it scared him. He's like, crap, I need to get healthy. I need to start. And so when that, that scientist, physicist brain came to medicine and came to new, research, nutrition research or an engineer, Right. He had had a, a TIA and he's like, oh, shit, I've got to get healthy. I'm going to I've got to figure this out immediately when they would get into the nutrition research. They would reach out to me and they're like, dude, what the hell? This I'm reading these research studies and this is like eighth grade stuff that literally my previous supervisor, I would he wouldn't have even wasted the energy to say you're fired. He would have just had security come and escort me out of the building. Like this is the worst and without exception, computer science, engineering, physicists, mathematicians, every single one of them is like, dude, nutrition research. How do you even begin to even make any recommendations based on it? And my answer is, well, increasingly, I don't. Increasingly, what I'm making recommendations on is based on archaeology, anthropology and paleoanthropology, because these are still disciplined arms of science. And it's it's well known in, in their literature what humans have eaten for hundreds of thousands of years and what they have only been eating for the last 100 years. So let's pull this into where do you want to start, medicine or nutrition? I would, I would go right there. I think that's also that goes to predictive value. So if we've been eating the same thing for thousands of years and we're now we've just recently changed that. When you look at the sort of evolutionary scale of things. And you think like, well, we're far more sick. Yes. Why, why are we saying that this is right? And this is one of my big points of contention with dietitians, which are state licensed. And so they have to prescribe the American food guidelines. And a lot of, I've gotten into some debate with people who have been like, M, like anybody, you can, the government doesn't tell me what to eat. I eat what I want. Well, that's not really true. And I mean, Nina Teicholz does a great job of this. But, you know, if you're in the military, if you're a, a, in public school, if you're on any like sort of food subsidies or whatnot, you are eating in a hospital, in a coma, right? That all is coming at you from the government's guidelines. And yep. you add to that, if you're going to somebody because you need to lose weight or you're unhealthy the, and you think, oh, I need to go to an RD because that's the most rigorous training. They do internships for a year or whatnot, right? In a hospital, it seems far more, um, you know, sort of like certified and official than going to your holistic friend who's telling you what to eat. But it's it's all, and I actually interviewed Mark Hegstead, who was the architect of the food pyramid. Um, I was the last person to interview him. He was in a nursing home and he finally sort of acknowledged that they'd gotten things wrong. And he said to me that he couldn't believe that by telling people not to eat fat, that carbohydrates and sugar would increase as much as they did and that that was a mistake. Right. Yeah. And you sort of think like, well, when they had that press conference where they announced the diet dietary guidelines, they were very clear. We have not had time to do any science. Yes. This is all political. And you have to keep in mind that at that point, the country was pretty prosperous, but we had a malnutrition problem. Yep. 
And so we had this sort of weird thing where we had the farm bill coming out. We had all these crops that we could subsidize, which would help the economy and help farmers and it would feed people. So we're solving two problems. But we didn't solve two problems because it turns out that eating lots of soy and eating lots of corn and all refined products that come from those are not what we should be eating. And the science never followed. I mean, there have obviously been some independent science, but even like the Harvard School of Public Health, that was initially funded by Kellogg. I believe that's right. It was one of these big food companies. And so like the influence of outside industry funding into nutrition is from the get go. Right. Like, and this is, you know, not me wearing a tinfoil hat last year, 2022, rather um, it, the largest amount of lobbying. So more than Wall Street, more than manufacturing was pharma and health. And it was three hundred and seventy three billion dollars that yep. went to members of Congress and the federal government. Well, what is that about that? We yeah. should all have a big like time out. I do not want the people telling me what to eat or what medicine to take, taking more money than any other American industry. So yeah, I, heard, I read a statistic that the average U.S. congressman has somewhere between five and 10 lobbyists dedicated just to them, just to them. And then the, the hundreds of thousands of dollars that are going to be floating around in that cesspool. I keep uh, people keep telling me I need to run for Congress. I'm like, you know what? I think I can do more good right here on social media where I can just talk to one person at a time. I don't think I'm going to be able to move the, ne the needle in Washington. Well, as long as you're allowed to keep talking, which is right. another issue, right? Which I wrote a little bit about for us at Broken Science, but the censorship stuff is a big deal because they're now through COVID, they did this sort of pressure test where they said that they were going to defer to the World Health Organization. So if you said something against the World Health Organization's guidelines, your content was taken down. Yep. Well, now they've expanded that. So it's the you know Dietetics Association, it's the American Medical Association. So if you're pushing things that are not in line with those guidelines, which you are not, right? Like are you not. are at risk for yes. having your whole channel taken down. But more importantly than that, I mean, I know it's through livelihood, right? In some part. And but it is also you look at how um when we have found problems with drugs, specifically drugs, but also honestly diet or anything else, it's usually patient advocacy groups yes. or individual researchers who sound the alarm. So this level of censorship that's deferring to what they call local health authorities prevents any advocacy groups from sounding the alarm, which historically has always been the way that we have learned we've gotten something yep. wrong. So that safeguard is incredibly important and it is eroding. And the, one of the problems is, is that many of the patient advocacy groups for a given medical condition is has literally been set up and funded by the pharmaceutical company that makes the drug that treats that condition. But the, the people who are members of that patient advocacy group, say for Parkinson's or, or for Alzheimer's, they have no idea that it's the Adelhelm manufacturer who has funded the entire thing and has complete editorial control over everything that's said by any of its authorities. And, but the average person who sends their 20 bucks a month or 20 bucks a year to try to help that, that organization, they have no idea. And just to, to bounce off Emily's point, I do have a channel on Rumble, guys. And so just out of an abundance of caution, uh, jump over to Rumble at some point and subscribe to my channel there just in case. Yeah, no, that's a good backup plan. I mean, I also try to encourage people to develop email lists. Uh, we're working on that. Yes, more absolutely. Direct you can go to your audience, the safer yeah. you And if, uh, all that, uh, if you want a free copy of my proper human diet guidebook based not only on modern nutrition research, but also archaeology, anthropology, and paleoanthropology, you can get a free copy that does put you on my email list, but I'm not a spammer. Surely you can tell that by talking to me. It's a link in the show notes. Now, Let's, what about these organizations? Uh, the National Osteoporosis Foundation. I yeah. used to be a member. I bought a DEXA scan for my office. I completely bought everything they were selling, memorized their physician's manual. I don't know if you know the the, the backside of, of the NOF story, but basically 
I mean, I think no. like, like the Komen Foundation is another great example of this, right? Absolutely. So, please yeah. talk and about you that. Know, and so basically, NOF was basically funded by the Fossil Max people and set up by them and run by them. Wow. And so I was basically being a little soldier for the Fossil Max pharmaceutical company. But I thought I was saving women's lives by getting a DEXA scan on everybody and putting everybody on Fossil Max back when I was an ignorant, idiot doctor also very arrogant, not a good, not a safe mix. Uh, that that's, that's the kind of medicine I used to practice. And so many doctors are practicing that kind of medicine today. They think they're doing a good job and people go see that doctor, Emily, looking for that certainty you talked about. This doctor seems very well versed. It seems like he's very confident in what he, what he told me. He said, take this, this will protect you. And now here's a person that's literally harming their health every single day of their life and not doing things they should be doing because they they think they have, they have this false certainty that they can hold close and, and feel protected by. Yeah. And I mean, I think the other part of that that's really important to acknowledge is that this stuff is overwhelming and you're yeah. dealing with health where you're vulnerable, maybe for the first time in your life or someone you love is vulnerable. And the idea of challenging authority in that environment is probably not, I don't think we're like kind of genetically made to do that, right? Agreed. So I think um, it's not completely fair for you and I who have spent a significant amount of time looking at these issues and, and we know how pervasive they are and we know how to counterbalance them, right? With good sort of critical thinking. I worry a lot about overwhelming the patient out there who's listening and thinking, well, how am I supposed to figure all this stuff out? And um, one of the things I'm doing is we have a class that's not quite done yet, though it's pretty close, but I want it to be perfect. That's navigating your own healthcare. And it's sort of me putting my statistical analysis hat on, as well as investigative reporting stuff to sort of say like, hey, if you're going through a health crisis or you're interacting with the medical industry in some way, how can you best chart your own course? And, a, and part of that is learning, you know, sensitivity and specificity and p-values and where is this research and can I look at the research and what's all-cause mortality and all these things that sound overwhelming, but actually should not be. Yes. And allow you to really, what I say is like, be a player in your own game. Do not get on the treadmill or conveyor belt or whatever we want to call it, where you go in and they say, and one of the best examples of this is diabetes, because it, it is treatable through diet. And instead, people are told like, oh, you're going to take this drug and then you're going to probably have to take this drug. And I mean, even the American Diabetic Association forever, they, I think, still do not have as their goal finding a cure to the disease. It's to help patients better manage I don't want help managing if there's a cure. I want to know what the cure is. Exactly. And you know, people I get upset when I say cure, but the truth is that like whether you're you've reversed it and you no longer have it, or it's a cure for me is semantics. So I, I think look at like Verta Health doing incredible work by getting people on a low carb diet, and people will be very critical of their published research because they say that it wasn't randomized. I mean, it's like, it's so dumb because like how you're not randomizing things. You're saying to people, Hey, do you want to try this alternative? So I'm not going to put somebody on insulin and put randomly put somebody else on a ketogenic diet. I'm going to say, Hey, if you want, I can tell you how to handle yeah. this your diet. And so that shouldn't take away from the significance of their results and the results of people don't know, or, you know, somebody who's type two diabetic, I highly suggest you look at their work because Absolutely. they have the longest, largest diabetes trial ever done. And they're reversing diabetes in the majority of the participants. That's unheard of, right? I mean, Eli Lilly is not doing that with insulin. No, absolutely. <laughs> can you, can you speak from a, a journalistic standpoint? Why is there not an article about Verta Health and their results? in major news journals and major newspapers every single day because these people are stopping all of their type 2 diabetes medication and they are achieving in in the majority of cases a normal hemoglobin A1C. Yes. I mean, based on what the average dietitian and doctor tells you, that's near miraculous. Like that shouldn't happen ever, maybe one out of a thousand, but they're they're like they're getting like 60s percent complete remission with no medication dr oh, david Unwin. not like yeah. this one, it, it like moment in time like these Multiple people are years they stay off of it yeah right? what's going on why are we not hearing about this in mainstream media 
Well, so I mean, that in particular, I actually have some personal experience with. A few years ago, I was recruited to do health stories for the Washington Post, and that was one of the stories that I pitched. And they basically, the editor, the health editor came back to me and she said, you know, I feel like you're a little biased. Why are you pushing this so hard? That's a private company. They funded their research. And I said, well, yeah, but who do you think funds all the insulin trials, right? Like the Eli Lilly and the other insulin providers are doing that. And you take that whole cloth. Why is this any different? And we can certainly, I mean, I would have written in there that it was a co private company, sure. but it doesn't take away from the results that they're putting forward and patients I could reach out to. I mean, I could verify the results, you know, on some level. And my thing was always like, you have the job as a journalist is to get the information to people that most benefits them right? That allows them to make better choices in their life, whether that's about politics or technology or what you eat or your health. And, and it was odd to me that I got so much pushback, but we were entering this phase where I was starting to realize there was a lot of, I mean, actually Boston Magazine, to give them credit, um, I'd written a bunch for, and they let me have a column that was on women's health, looking at sex differences in medicine. Um, because we have forever assumed that female bodies are the same as males. And it was very clear to me that like our brains are different. Our lungs are different. Our hearts are different. We get, we present different symptoms. Yep. We get different diseases in, in different proportions and we require different treatments though. We're not getting any because women were prohibited from being in clinical trials for decades. And even now are hugely underrepresented in clinical trials. Absolutely. Um, and so I, the editor of the magazine knew I was a serious journalist. And so he was like, all right, you can do all this health reporting on women. And I had a podcast that was sort of the sister to that column, but it had to be a column because it was, you know, somewhat my opinion. And so I think that saved them from it being a hard news story, even though it really wasn't. I mean, you can read those columns and it definitely has more of my voice in it than a news story would have because I was given that permission by having to be a column. But as far as the facts are concerned, it was, I reported on it just as I would have if it was a news story. So I, I do, I mean, I think I try to be really careful about this because in my experience, the advertising department in every news organization that I worked for was so separate that I didn't know anybody who worked in advertising. I mean, even at the Las Vegas Review Journal, which was not that huge of a newspaper, I think they were in a different building. Like we didn't interact at all. So I never felt like anybody said to me like, hey, um, you can't do that story. You know, we've got this big advertisers. Now I knew a lot of women who worked for mag women's magazines. And that was a little bit of a different can of worms. They were regularly told you can't do this, that, you know, or like we, this lipstick is a really big deal. The advertisers wants to push it. And so they'd get somebody to write about how it was like the best lipstick of the year. And like we they kind of didn't seem that big of a deal because it wasn't like life threatening or, right. you know, but in the long run or like when I look on it in hindsight, I think, you know what, that was a slippery slope because it, it actually sort of infected the rest of the industry in a way where when I was being told this by the Washington Post, it was very clear to me they didn't want any low carb stories. Yeah. They didn't what about now? What about uh, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC? I read recently that that half of CNN's ad budget their, for their news sec sector is pharmaceuticals. That's half of their their revenue. Uh, well, so, are they, are, so it, does that matter or, or are they still segregated? It's got to matter. matter. Right. And I think all these, you know, especially the the you know newspaper industry is suffering financially. So. There's no way that isn't a pressure point, right? Now, how much it's influencing editorial, I'd be, you know, stepping over my skis to try and say something really accurate about that. But it's got to be a pressure point. And I think if you look at COVID and you look at the vaccine, and I don't care where you fall in the vaccine debacle or debate or whatever, but the amount of money that was going towards like paid PSAs to tell people to get their vaccine. And even I'm in Boston and I would turn on NPR, you know, I drop my kids off at school and that's like what I listened to on the way home. And it was like the news, big news figures are saying like, hey, did you get your jab? I got mine. And it's like, holy smokes, this is not. And again, like you can think that that treatment is very efficacious and we all should get it. You That is absolutely unethical for somebody in a news department to be telling other people to be getting a medication. It's just like, it's not. The job would be to actually dig into that yes. and do stories on, is it what they're saying or not? 
And if you've come out and said that you already got it in the old days, you would be removed from the story because they'd say you're biased. You already had this treatment. You can't actually be now reporting on whether it works or not. That, I mean, there is no doubt that money impacted the coverage of COVID. That for that is for sure. I think that's all about the money was coming from the government. You can actually track it. There was a document that I found, um, which I don't know if you do show notes, but I'll try to find it for you so you can link to it. And it, is, yeah. it is the most sexist, awful talking points from the government to media saying you need to um, specifically talk about children getting COVID and being sick because the women are the ones who make the decisions in the household and they don't understand statistics. So they only understand emotion. Wow. So you have to make emotionally compelling stories about children getting sick so that women feel compelled to, to do this. Like women don't understand statistics. <laughs> women that don't understand in the document. Like wow. this is in the, these are the talking, it's explaining the talking points. Mm. And so, and you know, it's interesting because I think at Broken Science, we talk a lot about how COVID was this experience where people are talking about science in their households in ways that they were not five years ago. And I actually think that's sort of a gift because I think we I all need looking at all this stuff. And yeah. when I would talk about nutrition or cancer research or whatever, people would often be like, well, I'm like, if that were true, but now they're open a little bit more to wait a minute. Like we lost yeah. our freedom of assembly. We lost our right to free speech. We've all mobility, like all of these major, major American values were completely suspended in the name of public health and the confluence between public health and medicine, which is something that I'm really fascinated by because I actually think that's part of this problem. So like public health is to treat a population of people and you're trying to make a difference by treating a wide swath of people to have you know numbers needed to treat like one or two sometimes. That is not medicine. Exactly. As a doctor, I mean, you know this, you're charged with treating the patient in front of you. Absolutely. And you look at that patient and what is their makeup and what is their risk? We didn't do any of that. And I think that started with nutrition. Yeah. So and I think I think the the this recent thing that we've all been through the last three years, it's it's a blessing. And I love that your your thoughts on that because I think that there's a large percentage of the common sense population, not the conspiracy theory people, but just regular folks who have just literally woken up and looked around and went, what the hell? So, but if I can't believe that source, yeah, then what else should I be doubting? But then I think it's also been a curse because the, the subset who are already kind of doubting everything, they're off to the races now. Literally, if, it, if it's said on a, on a news website, it, the exact opposite is true. And I think a lot of people have went too far but I love the fact that the average person is like, yeah, I don't just blindly believe anything I see on TV anymore or what my doctor says for that matter. I kind of question everything. And I think that's a super healthy place to hang out uh, mentally and physically, although it, can, it, it, it what does it do, though, Emily? It takes away that certainty that you used to have. It was very comforting, kind of like your security blanket as a kid or your favorite soft and cuddly animal. You don't have that anymore. It's almost like it made, it made us grow up. And we had to go, OK, so the world is an uncertain place, sometimes dangerous. Uh, I need to be circumspect and I need to be thinking about all things at all times. Guess what, my friends? That's the definition of being an adult. At least it was 100 years ago. Now I think we're kind of back in that same boat again. And a lot of people, it, it increases anxiety. It's not a lot of fun. You're having to do all this hard thinking all the time. Guess what? That's what it means to be a human being, my friends. I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think we have a, a sort of culture right now that has such a strong victim mentality that I hope that people work. see this. And instead of saying like, oh, I can't do anything, it does the opposite, where it sort of inspires you to realize like you have to be charting your own course. Absolutely. And, and I think this is, you know, what, we have our different societies in part because I think they all kind of bleed into each other. And I think, you know, we see this with education. Right. It's the same. Oh, okay. I think with medicine, one of the things that I um, I think is is interesting and overwhelming and really important for people to know that this is not just COVID. It is not just nutrition. Like in Boston here, we just had this big Dana-Farber scandal where there were 57. Yeah, please, uh, go into that. Let's talk about that a minute, because I think that's a great example of what we're yeah. talking about here. 
So we had 57 papers that, you know, Dana-Farber is the big Harvard Medical School Cancer Institute, Research Institute and Hospital. So they treat patients and they do a lot of research. Um, and there were 57 papers that were flagged. Now, they were flagged by this guy named Shalto David, who is a hobbyist. So there's a site called PubPeer. And yep. he's regularly on there and he's a data sleuth. So he looks at images and he tries to see if they've been manipulated or not. Now, PubPeer is a really cool place to kind of hang out if you're into, if you want to geek out on any of this stuff, because really it's an anonymous site where people can comment on medical research and flag problems with it. So it's a safe place for whistleblowers, right? So if you're working in a lab and you know something's going not going the way it should go, it's a great place for you to go and report that stuff. Um, now, I've talked to, Shalto, and he is very nice and totally overwhelmed with the attention that he's been getting. But what happened was he flagged these papers a long time ago and he reached out to all the researchers and he reached out to the journals and nothing happened. So he published on a blog. And now let's be clear about what he found. Yeah. He found blatant fraud. It was not like, oh, this researcher accidentally misused this image the researchers, uh, one in particular, was was literally copy and pasting images show, uh, that should should be showing before and after, and he was using the false images. He was absolutely blatantly doing this to deceive. I don't think there's any way you can explain this any different. Well, yeah, I mean, I like to be careful because as somebody who's to cover crime, like I think say somebody committed fraud until they've been convicted of fraud, but it looks, it looks really bad. Yes. So you're right. Like there were, you know, one of the jokes that we had on our little team that's been working to cover some of these stories is that like, if you had some mice and they were like, Hey, in the first picture, the likelihood that you're going to get them to be like, Hey, in the exact same post six months later in the intervention group is zero. Like it's just, right. there's no way that you can get the mouse to pose the same way. Right. And it, and it was that. So they were, it, it appears that they were taking mice from, you know, day one of the placebo group or the intervention group and then copying and pasting them. So this is not even high tech and putting them into later in the intervention group. Now the intervention group is a drug treatment. So they're right. saying look, in this placebo group, these tumors grew and in the intervention group, they did not. That's really dangerous. Absolutely. You're claiming efficacy for something that there was no efficacy. So there are 57 papers flagged. The problem becomes at Dana-Farber, and I'm sure this is typical of these kinds of big research institutions, gets lots of money from the federal government. So my first question would be like, why isn't the federal government doing this? That's my money as a taxpayer. Yep. And so if you are lying and committing fraud, potentially, I want my money back. Well, the Absolutely. way this works is that you actually, the federal government won't get involved until the independent institution has said, yes, we did find scientific misconduct. So what's happening with this, which I think is, it, you know, this got a little bit of media attention. The Harvard Crimson, the newspaper at Harvard broke the story, not the mainstream media. A week later, Stat News did a piece that was very soft on everybody. Yep. The Wall Street Journal did a better piece where they pushed back on the man who's in charge of the internal investigation, who happened to be the author on two papers. So he is not That's the article I read that, that it got on my radar was the, the journal article. So he recused himself from evaluating his own work, but he is co-author with almost all of the other suspected authors on other works. So he yeah. knows them very well. And Lori Glimsher, who's the head of Dana Farber, is named on several of these papers, and that's his boss. So you tell me. Can you do an accurate internal affair, unbiased internal investigation of your boss and your yep. co-workers? I mean, we have video of Lori Glimsher at a party saying that the guy doing the investigation is like her best friend. Now, let so, me let me just let me okay, repeat something. The person, for... the person who accepts or rejects this internal investigation is Lori Glimsher. Right. Now, let me repeat for everybody listening, all 1,200 of you guys. This is one of this is one of the top 10 cancer research institutions in the world at Harvard University. OK, huge. If they do a drug trial and they have a, they publish a paper that says, yes, this cancer, this chemotherapeutic absolutely works immediately. It's picked up by every oncologist on planet Earth because everybody follows the lead of the, the, the northeastern 
part of the United States when it comes to medical science. Everybody. So there's doctors in India now prescribing this drug. There's doctors uh, in South Af Africa. Everybody's like, oh, my God, this drug, man, it's going to change the world. And this shit was was literal fraud. And so now we're going to do an investigation. And the guy's boss, uh, a.k.a. best friend, is the one that's going to sign off on his investigation that he's doing with her other friends. Well, and also that he's investigating her. So yeah. like just it's really simple. I, you, you're my boss and you're accused of, let's say, sexual harassment, right? Like put it in another realm. Yep, yep. My job, we're best friends. We go out for drinks. We love hanging out together. My job is to investigate you. Yeah. Like, and, and then, then that's going to be binding and everybody's going to act like that's a real investigation. Ken did this. It's up to Ken to decide whether he accepts or rejects my findings. Yeah. And so like the, there's no way that you can have research integrity and say that you're doing this investigation. So I actually think they're committing scientific misconduct by the way they're doing the investigation. Absolutely. And then you have to also keep in mind that there's this other, that, you know, we've sort of become apathetic, I think partly because of the political sphere is so toxic to this level of corruption. So all these people who are doing stories in the media on this, it seems to have just sort of passed by and no one did a single story on patient impact. So like, for instance, if you read or like earlier in your medical career, before you were as enlightened as you are now, you read a peer reviewed journal article that says this treatment is effective. Do you go and do any of your own research or do you just take that whole cloth and start prescribing it? No, that's a brilliant question. So Let's go back in time. Let's go back to Dr. Barry at the Barry Clinic in 2004, before, before I became pre-diabetic, -pre severely obese, and said, shit, I'm, I'm sick. I got to fix myself. Let me do some of my own research. So, And I can give you examples of this, like uh, all the, the lipid research on total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol. I never knew back in 2004 when I was putting every female patient I had with any risk factors for heart disease whatsoever, I was putting every single woman on a high dose statin. I had no idea that none of the statin research had been, it was only done on men. Literally, there's, I don't, I, up, I don't even know when the first year that women were included in the statin studies. I had no idea that it was completely inapplicable to female biology that it had never, not only been, it had never been proven efficacious, it had never been proven safe to prescribe a statin to, to a woman. I thought I, Dr. Barry at the Barry Clinic, was saving the world, putting every one of my female patients on a high-dose statin. Now I know better. Now I know. About that a little, like how, because one of the things that I'm really interested in, and I hope this course that we have really empowers patients to go ask their doctors questions, which yes. then pushes the doctor to do more research. But it is very hard. I mean, the medical community, I think it's also worth saying like doctors, the morale for doctors right now is lower than Awful. it's ever been. Awful. It's very hard to be a doctor. We're building this doctor, you know, medical society. And part of my goal is to actually bring people together so that they feel a sense of camaraderie again on the art and science of yeah. medicine, right? And absolutely. Uh, but like, how, what was it in your journey that brought you to a place where you could reflect enough on? Because I think I, you know, I'm not a doctor, but if I had been prescribing medicine to people or treatments that didn't work and that were potentially harmful, it would be a huge reckoning. Uh, to yeah. reflect on that and yeah. and change course. So what it was, was and so my my epiphany came when I was becoming pre-diabetic and I, and so I basically lived in scrubs, Emily, because I was working in full time in the emergency department, but also as an ER doctor, also full time in my clinic. So I just lived in scrubs. There was no time to wear anything else, right? And scrubs have this long drawstring around the waist, right? And so your scrubs always fit regardless. But I, I could tell I was putting on a little weight now, I'll be honest. But then I jumped on the scale one day and I was like, what the hell? I Damn. Okay. So I'm, I'm obese. I need to probably check some labs. And I was pre-diabetic. Uh, HSCRP very high. 
uh, triglycerides sky high. Just I was I was metabolically sicker than shit. That'd be the technical term, okay? <laughs> and and I'm like, well, I don't want to start taking a bunch of medicine. So I went to the American Diabetes Association website, and I, I and and I actually had the printout, the PDF from the ADA that I gave to every patient I diagnosed with diabetes. And so I grabbed one of those from my nurse. And I went to the, when I got home, went to the website. I'm like, okay, I'm going to start doing all this stuff. So stop bacon, stop saturated fat, stop animal foods, eat lots of whole grains, uh, fruit juice smoothies, lots of fruits and vegetables, and start jogging. That's basically right. And so I did all that, Emily. Three months later, I rechecked my labs. I was more pre diabetic and I gained two or three more pounds. Uh. So my epiphany was my N of, N of one. Was that, and so it's very common, you may not know this about doctors, but we constantly doubt our patients. So when I would give a, a newly diagnosed diabetic the handout and say, here, eat this way, stop eating all that other shit, join the gym, join Weight Watchers, take this medicine. When they would come in in three months, Emily, and their A1C was higher or no better, and they'd be like, I'm doing everything you told me. In my mind, I'm like, mm -hmm, right, you are. Sure, sure. Yeah. You ain't, you're laying on the couch eating ding dongs. I know exactly what you're doing. Because obviously, I, as a doctor, had been trained and I was not trained incorrectly. So they had to be lying. And maybe it was unconscious. Maybe they thought they were, but they just kind of weren't. Well, but you know, the, the example that I like to give of that exact phenomenon is the non alcoholic fatty liver. Yes. Right? Which we've reclassified as non alcoholic yes. because sugar is destroying the liver. Yes. And Oh, and it forever, it was a disease that alcoholics got and nobody else. And so people would go in with and present as having fatty liver and the doctors would not believe that they weren't drinking too much. I, I was one of those doctors. I remember that. I would have patients. I'm like, dude, there's no way you have to be drinking. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we would see AST and ALT elevated, be like, dude, you're drinking. And they're like, no, I swear to God, I'm, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. I don't drink. And we're like, you're totally drinking. There's no way. Maybe. And I would even say, well, maybe. There's a cough syrup you've been taking that's got alcohol in it that you don't realize, or maybe you're using a lot of vanilla extract because it has alcohol. And they're looking at me like, screw you, dude. I'm not doing any of that. And so, you know, now that a non-alcoholic used to be called alcoholic fatty liver. Now it's called non-alcoholic fatty liver. Soon it's going to be renamed metabolic associated fatty liver disease because it's it no longer has anything to do with alcohol. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. I was I was practicing when that was happening. And so my epiphany came when I could not deny that I had taken my own advice. Mm -hmm. I couldn't say, oh, he's full of crap. He, no, I live with me. I know what I was doing. I was jogging as much as I hated it. I was jogging three days a week. I was I was making a, instead of uh, chocolate milk with donuts, I was having a fruit juice smoothie every morning for breakfast and I was having fat free turkey on whole wheat bread. It didn't help at all. It made it worse. And so then as a rational person, I had to go, okay, dude, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. How many of your patients that you totally in your mind accused of being bullshit, they were doing what you were telling them. It just doesn't work. And that was my epiphany. And I've apologized multiple times on social media. I've, I've tuned up and cried before on social media, apologizing for the egregious harm I probably did. So and how do you, how would you, I mean, I think that your personal experience was the, you know, sort of the motivation or the catalyst rather for yep. this change. But when you talk to other doctors who let's say aren't metabolically unhealthy, they just prefer, you know, they, they, let's just say they eat a better diet or they're healthier right. status quo. How do you think it's the most effective way to communicate to them? Like the recommendations are not helping anybody. You know, I'm not sure. I think the way I communicated on YouTube seems to resonate because I have, I have a lot of nurse practitioners, physicians, assistants, primary care doctors who are reaching out to me saying, dude, I, I and, and here's, here's how it's actually happen, happening, Emily. They have patients who watch my YouTube videos, who are, have an A1C of 12, they're type two, severe type two diabetic, and they've got them on all the medicines and they're just progressively getting worse. Their patient sees one of my YouTube videos and goes, huh, that's weird, let me try that. 
Six months later, their A1C is 5.6. And they've stopped all the medication. And the doctor's like, what? Now, the first time a doctor hears that, they're like, anecdote, this is, I don't know what's going on here. Maybe the, the patient probably has cancer undiagnosed. That's why they've lost all this weight and they're so, you know. But when they hear it second time, and the third time, and the tenth time, and the twentieth time, and that's what that. And then I have a doctor reach out to me. They're like, "What the hell are you doing?" I did, well, how do I? How do? And so there's actually we've. Uh, I I wasn't involved, but there's a society now called the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners, and so I don't think we're going to be able to capture the existing institutions. No, I, I think we're going to have to create parallel institutions. Uh, we're going to have to create something that's that's not the AMA but serves the same role that the AMA used to serve back when and they were actually like a medical society. That's yes, what you're talking about. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. And so, but I have doctors every day reach out to me, pharmacists, physical therapists, all the paramedical people are, they're like, dude, I thought you were a, a charlatan. A, a, what is it? A quack, a hack, a, a grifter. That's the word. But then after like the 10th patient of mine came in and they had completely reversed their type two diabetes and their fatty liver, and they had to get off their blood pressure medicine because their blood pressure was so low. I'm mm -hmm. like, maybe this dude's onto something. So I've watched a few of your videos and now I'm, I'm whole hog. My entire practice is keto or ketovore or carnivore. I, I think, and I think, so my bottom up approach seems to have gotten to the middle. I'm sure I've had no impact at the top and never will. But that's fine with me. If I can save a million people from the awful complications of type 2 diabetes, I mean, they're just, you don't even want to think about it. It's so yeah. terrible. Yeah. That's it. That's my job as a doctor is to help people improve their health. I've done my job. My job is not to convince the AMA or the ADA or the AHA. They can all line up and kiss my ass for all I care. I want to help as many millions of people as I can so they don't need the medications anymore. I love that. And I mean, I think, you know, the other part that I always feel like kind of is interesting, just taking it out of the medical sphere a little bit and saying to people, what do you think the likelihood is that eating meat, vegetables, right? The, the kill it, grow it, you can eat it versus going and eating like the middle of the supermarket, which tastes delicious and is cheap and has no nutritional value. Like, why are we pushing those products? When like so clearly they're lacking in any of the nutritional needs that we have metabolically, you know, how do you feel after you eat them? I mean, alcohol is the same way, right? Like when people are like, oh, you know, there's a new study that says alcohol is great. Or there's a study that says alcohol is killing everybody. I'm always like, well, how do you feel? Right? Like if you drink too much, do you feel great? Right. Do you have a lot of energy? Right. Yeah. So like, be aware of yourself. But I think what happens when people become, you know, metabolically deranged and they can't access their fat stores is they're hungry all the time. And so then we we do this sort of shaming of people where we say like, oh, you know, Sally can afford to miss a meal or whatever. And it's like, it's so cruel when actually what they're doing is they're eating exactly the way that they've been told to eat. Yep. It's just that what they've been told is wrong. Absolutely. And so they're following directions. They're not rebellious, right? They're not going, they're not lying. They're not doing all of these nefarious things. They're literally starving inside Yep. And we're all being, you know, mean and shaming of them for yep. doing what they've been told to do. And that Absolutely. that's what really revs me up and gets me going. Cause I same, think same for me. So, cause I now know all my patients, not all of them, but most of them were following my advice to some degree and it wasn't helping at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, if they followed my advice too closely, it would actually make them more diabetic. So you know, a lot, a lot of doctors don't like to face stuff like that. And you've read stories probably of, of old doctors on their deathbed and they go to their grave still not accepting um, like the doctors that that basically drum Semmelweis out of practice and put him in an insane asylum. Right. I mean, there's all these stories in medicine, the lobotomy yeah. story. I don't know if you've ever looked into that or not, but it was considered standard of care to lobotomize a 10 or 11 year old boy if he was too unruly. That was standard of that Harvard Mayo. They would have said, yes, he needs a lobotomy. This is this is not new in medicine. We've done this many, many times. We've been here many, many times. And I love what you're doing to reach out to just people and say, hey, you can understand absolute risk versus relative risk. You're smart enough. You're, you're a waitress. You're a truck driver. You work at Walmart. 
you're smart enough to understand this. If you can balance your checkbook, you can understand the basics of the science that you need to understand so that you can basically have a built-in bullshit detector and go. Oh, and I think the other th part of that that I like the most is that like, I feel like you go and you hang out with like your mechanic or the waitress or whoever. And it's like, they're doing risk reward all day. All day. Right? All day. It's do That's I do what this? Life do I is. Have this much? This part costs this much. This part's from China. This part's in the U S like how much am I going to invest in my, client, right? All of that. You're, that's how our brains are wired to work. Exactly. They're wired to make these evaluations. But what's happened is that we've, we haven't, we have no confidence in people making their own decisions. So, yep. so much of this has been built around deferring to authority. And it is scary when you're vulnerable to challenge somebody or whatever, but I think there's a polite way to do it yes. and it may save your life. Right. So I have this show coming out that we've talked a little bit about called Emily Unleashed, where I'm talking to people who have challenged the status quo or changed a paradigm in some way. And I'm calling it the art and science of paradigm shifting because it's not just researchers. Obviously, I know a ton of medical researchers and, and there will be a lot of them. But I also wanted to talk to people who are sort of like, you know, warriors in their own right. So I just interviewed this amazing woman who I know who's in Boston, who has been working to educate girls in Afghanistan with underground schools using technology. So she takes over radio stations and she does all this cool stuff to get the information to girls under the Taliban rule, which, you know, obviously says girls are not supposed to be educated anymore. So people like that I'm focusing on, but the goal for that is to let everybody know that we don't have any progress if we all just go along Absolutely. and that, yeah, sometimes it's hard to challenge other people, but asking questions shouldn't be something that is considered a negative and that it is really like you don't want to be a sheep because if you're a sheep, you're going to be put out to pasture probably sooner than you're ready. You will to. become lamb chop. That you will. The, it, you absolutely will. And what that means in human life is, big pharma will they will they will take your money for the rest of your life. Big food will take your money for the rest of your life. They will convince you this is healthy. This is special K with skim milk. It's good for you. You will buy that for the rest of your life. Instead of buying real human food, you will take the statin for the rest of your life. You'll take the, the PCSK9 inhibitor or the benzoic acid. You will take that for the literally a copay every month for the rest of your life. That's how you become a sheep. If, you, if you're just content to be in the middle of the herd and not stick your head up and go, I wonder what's going on around here. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that you have to deny the treatment, right? Like it's just, That's you right. want to go in knowing that you're making the right decision for yeah. yourself and that, you know, all, you know, you're doing that risk reward and you could ideally you would do it with your doctor, right. Yeah. Or, or your family. Or Absolutely. And the, doctor, the, right? the concept that the average person is not able to do that risk reward calculation. People should be so offended by that, that, Oh, you're, you're not in the Ivy tower. you you don't have a PhD. You, you don't live in the Northeastern part of the United States and go to you and work at a university there. You can't understand risk reward. I love your, your, your analogy. Like, dude, you, you have to buy parts. Do you get from the reputable company? It costs a dollar more or this company that's kind of sketchy. It's $2 cheaper. You, you make those kind of determinations every single day of your life and just living your human life. You're doing risk reward. By definition, or you'd already be dead, right? You'd have already jumped off the house because you thought that looked like a fun thing to do. You made that judgment not to do that. Everybody's capable of this. And I love that you're actually talking to regular people, Emily. Give us some examples. What? So somebody's going to the doctor and the doctor said, hey, your LDL is high. You need to take a statin. And it's a it's a 50-year-old woman who has no other risk factors. Let's just pick an example of your choice and let's walk through a doctor visit. How would you talk to a doctor without being an asshole? Yep. Without being too confrontational. Well, so I think there's a couple of things. I generally think you have to know yourself. So if you are somebody who's feeling really nervous, you think you're gonna, you have just gotten some really serious diagnosis, or you're worried about a very serious diagnosis, the best advice is to bring somebody with you who can be the bad cop, right? So in an ideal scenario, we would all have an advocate who's a best friend or a mom or a husband or whatever who goes and they're the ones that are charged with asking all the questions so that you don't feel like the person, the doctor doesn't like you. Because Excellent. once you get into that mindset, every decision the doctor tells you, you're going to go to this place of, oh, they don't like me. They don't have time for me. I upset them. And you need to put that aside. I mean, you know, 
there, there's sort of the emotional part of the brain and the logical part of the brain. And when we're in crisis, it's the logical part of the brain that shuts down. And so that's normal. And you have to know yourself well enough to know, it, are you going to be that? Or are you going to be able to advocate for yourself? And if you don't have somebody, I mean, part of what this class is going to do is, you know, I'm using sort of my communication and I have a crisis management firm on the side that I also run. And so I'm using some of those tricks to sort of pull into this. But once you get in there and somebody recommends any course of treatment, and I think like this is true for like you go to the dermatologist and they want to give you some skin cream, right? And I actually just had somebody who was working on a shoot with me for the Emily Lee show who said who's done a couple of projects with me. And he was like, Em, you're not going to believe this, but like, I have these moles. And the, I went to my dermatologist and he's in LA and fancy and, you know, could go anywhere. And the doctor gave him some cream. And he's like, and because of everything that I've learned from you, I was like, all, I need to look up what all cause mortality is with this skin cream, right? Which is my favorite question. Cause all cause mortality is simply yeah. saying that people live longer or shorter or the same as those who don't take this treatment. So it yep. is, it should be the gold standard that we all ask about everything we do Agreed. because you don't want to treat the rash on your skin. If it's going to make you live less or live sh a shorter life, right. Yep. Or a more unhealthy life or lead to other things where you're going to need other treatments that are going to also hamper your ability to enjoy or live life. So it turned out it was actually a kind of chemotherapy that was really strong that he didn't need. He was doing, it wasn't cancer that he had on his face, right. but it, he didn't like it. And this, that, you know, for his own vanity or whatever, like he wanted to get rid of it. So he could go and pay for an expensive laser or he could have taken this cream and the cream was less expensive. So the doctor thought, well, that's what you're going to prefer. Well, the doctor probably didn't know that this is, you know, chemotherapy comes with lots of downstream effects that aren't so great. So if you don't need it, you don't do it. Right. So all cause mortality is the one that I think, gosh, and you know what? Every doctor should know for every treatment that they're recommending, what does this mean? And so one of the other points that I like to make, because I do think this has to be a relationship, right? So it's not you just going in and hammering them like a deposition. It needs to be a conversation where they know that you're respectful and they know that you respect their authority and that you're not challenging them as an individual, but you're challenging the system. Yes. And putting it in that framework helps to diffuse things for people. So I also think, you know, being able to ask questions about, and one of my other favorite tricks is standard of care is what doctors have to prescribe. And standard of care is not actually as efficacious in every cir circumstance. And doctors are so focused on treating the thing that you came into the doctor you know, the ailment, the rash, the whatever, and that's their specialties. That's what they know the most about. And they may have a great record of treating that thing, right? So actually a good example of this is um, IVF. Doctors who, you know, help with fertility problems, their ranking or rating is based on whether they can get a woman pregnant or not. So they'll often tout like, oh, 90% of people who come see me, I get pregnant, but they don't, what you want to ask is how many of them have live healthy babies? Because there's tons of miscarriages when you get into that realm of medicine. Yep. And actually what you want to know is how many babies are born because I don't want to have a miscarriage. I want right. to have a baby. Right. And so there's little things like that, but I actually think the best trick is to say to the doctor, what would you do if you were me? Because it alleviates them from standard of care and doctors have a lot of institutional knowledge and wisdom and things they've seen. And they very often think the patient wants a treatment, but if Absolutely. you, that off of the table and you say like if you were in my situation would you have the surgery would you take the drug i guarantee you you will very often get a very different answer because most doctors are really reluctant to treat themselves yep. because they see all the complications and i mean just like you right you you thought you were doing what was right and when you realized that it wasn't working for you you stopped everything figured out what was the alternative and then did that now, yep. if you're talking about, you know, again, it could be something benign, like say you have acne, right? Well, you say to the doctor, like, what would you do? The doctor might say, well, I'd cut out dairy, actually. Like, try doing that before you take some cream that may for mm -hmm. affect fertility in 20 years, right? Yep. We don't do that because there is this um, almost like wall where I think we feel like, I think doctors feel like they're in this position where they're doing this and they're not a human 
right? There has to be some distance, especially when it comes to sort of critical care and decisions. Psychologically, it's really hard to be invested in your patients if you think yes. they're going to die, right? And I think that goes, that actually goes out quite far. And so a way to sort of break through the wall, break it down is to say like, what would you do? Or like, what, if I could, like, if I didn't want to do this, what would be the alternative? Can you give I me a options? And yes. no doctor should say like, there's no options, right? Now what's interesting, no. if you look at this from the research side of things, we do a horrible job following people who don't do what is prescribed or recommended. So if you say to your doctor, like, hey, I know you thought I should have this surgery, but I'm actually going to wait six months or I'm not going to get the mammogram because I, you know, I kind of know a little bit about sensitivity and specificity and they're not really great detecting devices. Well, you would want somebody to follow that patient and say, yeah. like, they have better or like as a doctor, I would want to know, like, is my batting average better or worse with patients that follow what I say or don't, but we don't track any of that. So once you decide to not do the care, you're out on your own. So we don't even have an accurate comparative model to say, like when people pick the alternative, how well do they do compared to what standard of care is? And that's a huge miss, I think, in terms of- oh, I love things. that. I love that. But nobody's ever going to do that research because what it could reveal is that you your treat your standard of care is actually worse than placebo? That's what it could reveal. So who I mean, there's not a FDA approved patented drug at the end of that. So who wants to pursue that? I love that. So guys, when you go to the doctor, if they say, okay, you've got this, you need to do this, this, and this, say, doc, okay, just man to man, woman to woman, take off your doctor hat. If you were in my shoes, I'm not asking you standard of care. If you were in my shoes, what would you do? And leave it at that because the, I love the human nature of that interaction because it takes them out of their doctor role. Now it's just two people talking mm -hmm. and they're not being held to that standard of care. They're, they're just like, oh, what would I do? Well, and I've had patients do that to me before. And I was 100 percent honest with them every single time because it brought it brought the conversation from doctor patient to two people talking. Mm -hmm. And that that's very, very powerful. Another great thing that I love, I teach all the people in our private community. When you go to the doctor, preface the entire visit with, look, I'm not here for a prescription. Mm -hmm. If you decide that I don't need a prescription for this, I am perfectly happy with that with that decision. I'm, I'm not here looking for a prescription. That is so powerful to free the doctor now that because you you may not know this, but the average doctor thinks that the patient expects a prescription or they have not done their job. And in many cases, that is true. I've had some moms of kids. They're like, if you don't write me a prescription for an antibiotic for this kid, I'm going to kick your butt and go down the street to another doctor. That is that happens. And so when a patient says, I do not want a prescription, if that's not the best thing. I can't tell you how much that frees a doctor to just be like, okay, so you just want to know, is this something to worry about or not? If so, we'll do something. If not, we'll do nothing. Because very, very often, Emily, doing nothing is the best med medical uh, intervention of all. Do mm -hmm. nothing. That's often the best medicine of all. There's a great quote by Voltaire, which I'm not going to get right, but it, it's right along those lines, which is basically that the art of medicine is letting nature do its job while the doctor babysits the patient. Yes. Stand right. still and shut up as the doctor and let the patient heal. Very often that is the, that is the, that should be the standard of care for medicine at very, and, very often. You know, going back to what you said before, I, that advice is something that I give people all the time. And I just said it on a different show because I think it really is important for patients to know that doctors get rated. And I mean, some of the online stuff that doctors have to deal with is yeah. horrible. And people yeah. are far more likely to write a bad review than they are to write a good review. Absolutely. So there's a different pressure point for doctors to make sure that the visit is successful also. And I think exactly like you said, if you feel that you would rather not get a prescription or you'd rather wait a little longer, it is on you to communicate that because the default is prescribe, prescribe, prescribe. And there have been very well done, you know, psychological studies that have shown that patients do feel like the visit was a waste of their time if they don't leave with a script. Yep. 
so, you know, which, you know, you can kind of like common sense, you kind of understand, like I have a sore throat. I took the day off of work. I feel like crap. Now I'm going to drive to the doctor. I should have just stayed home in bed. Like there's a logical part of that, but it's on you to tell the doctor like, Hey, if I don't need this, I don't want it. And the other thing that's very similar to that, that's also goes into the sort of more psychological realm. And I think it's actually, the study is pretty old. It's probably like 15, 20 years old at this point, but um, it's probably much worse now is that doctors tend to listen to the first two or three symptoms that a patient lists, whereas patients will list their least significant symptoms first. So you go in, you're nervous. You're not going to say that, you know, you felt like your heart stopped for a couple of seconds or whatever it is. First, you're going to mention that you're tired or that you're sweating more or whatever. And actually that's all the doctor hears because they're already thinking like, how do I code this visit? And what's the billing thing? And I got to get over to the computer and I'm already an hour and a half behind. And there's all kinds of non-medical things going on through the doctor's mind. So it really is in your interest, as awkward as it feels to go in and say the things that you are most concerned about first, right? Absolutely. I I have breast cancer because of X, right? Yep. And uh, you know what else? I think from the patient standpoint, saying the big things first alleviates the stress. And so you're able to then relax in the doctor's office, listen to what they say. We have a really hard time listening when we're stressed out. And so if you say like, hey, this is my concern, hopefully the doctor says, all right, well, let me look. And they look and they say, you know what? That's not a, that, that's actually not a symptom of the thing you're concerned about. Or we're going to do these tests, but I don't think it's likely. Or you know what? I have no idea. Let's check it out. But in any case, your duty of reporting the thing that you've been harboring in your head that's been making you nervous is gone. It's out there. It's shared. You can move on and listen carefully. So it's, it's good just, you know, not just because the doctor only hears the first couple of things, but it also changes the whole energy and dynamic of the visit for you to say, like, I've been really nervous. I am, this may be nuts, but like, I have this idea that I have this problem. And I think, or you can get down to that level of interacting one-on-one patient, human to human, the better it is for both people. Nobody goes and becomes a doctor so that they can sit and enter billing codes. They do it because they want to help the patient in front of them. And we have made that incredibly prohibitive. So I think, you know, we can all help each other do a little bit more of that. Good Lord, Emily Kaplan. I could talk to you for hours. Uh, Is there, do you guys watching this, do you think there should be a part two with Emily Kaplan? Because I haven't even gotten into like any of the dirt of any other. I know, I know, I know. But but I think this human nature stuff, the the psychology of this, I think that stuff is incredibly important. And the average patient has no idea the psychology going on behind the stethoscope. They don't know the doctor's motivation. They don't know their pain points. So I think this is this this discussion has been invaluable for patients to just know. Oh, okay. So doctors. They're just dudes and chicks, just like me. They had they're distracted. They're they're maybe didn't sleep well last night. That's they're just like me. Okay, so I need to talk to them human to human. I think that's that's there's no value I can even place on that. It's, it's invaluable. Uh, we anyway, yeah. that I think we touched on a little bit, but just it's important to reiterate. Yes, it's the idea of not challenging them, and that people become really um, passive in this kind of medical experience. And actually it's not serving, that's not what the doctor wants either. The doctor wants to be healthy. And so if you come at it from a, you know, polite, I like to say like use humor and use questioning, right? Not in an aggressive way, but in a, just being honest, I feel really scared. Yes. I don't know how to say this, but I don't understand the medical research. And I'm told that I need to ask you about all cause mortality. And the doctor's going to say like, why do you need to ask me about all cause mortality? And he's like, I listened to this podcast and they said, it's the most important question. Yep. What is all cause mortality for my acne medicine? Right. Oh. And the doctor, like, together. Please, so, please, Lord in heaven, let every patient ask that question from this day forward. I will die a happy man. That's all. <laughs> and yes, please ask your doctor about the all cause mortality of the treatment they're suggesting versus not doing that treatment because that's a big deal. That's maybe the biggest deal, right?
Maybe. And then there are other things, which I mean, we can get into in part two, yeah. or you know, I'm happy to follow up with anybody who has more questions, but like the relative risk, absolute risk is a really big one. And that's a big one with reporters who don't understand the difference. You yes. want to know absolute risk for things. Relative risk is meaningless unless you know absolute risk. That's yes. really easy stuff. It's not complicated, but it just, it sounds like, oh God, I'm going to have to go back to the you know, class I took on math. Like yes and no, it's worth knowing. And it's because actually you'll read the news differently. You'll read Absolutely. all kinds of information differently once you have those sort of statistical tools. It will empower you to look at the world in a in a different way, a more circumspect way. I totally agree. Emily Kaplan, ladies and gentlemen, where can we find you? Uh, and because I see the comments, people are like, I've got to look this chick up. So I'm mostly on Instagram. I've recently got gotten back on Twitter or X because I feel like that does seem to be like the place where people are having these most interesting conversations about this kind of stuff. You need so to I'm be on X. Yes. Emily Kaplan X on X makes it a little easy to remember <laughs> on Instagram. I'm news, not noise. Um, and we're bro at broken science initiative. And my new show is at Emily underscore unleashed. Um, and then our YouTube channel, actually, for people who want to learn some of these statistical things, I am sort of like awkward and uncomfortable, but I go through and try and break down sensitivity and specificity, all-cause mortality, hazard ratio. Um, I get into some of the sort of Bayesian frequentist stuff, which we haven't talked a lot about, but we really think that that's where the break happened in science. Yep. Um, so there's a whole bunch of how-to videos, and they're in lots of different, or they should be soon in lots of different languages also. Um, so people can go and, you know, you can watch those and you'll get something out of it. And then hopefully you, before you go to the doctor, just watch it again and it'll refresh your memory of like, what is absolute risk and relative risk? And like, what was this study on, um, our newsletter, which is at brokenscience.org. I highly recommend people sign up for right now. We're doing one curated piece. So one piece that's in the news that we want to draw attention to. And then we're doing a lot of really good original reporting. So people who are interested in statins, we have Marianne DeMassey writing for us. Malcolm Kendrick did a four-part series that was fantastic. Um, we're breaking a bunch of the Dana-Farber stories because nobody else seems to be reporting on them. And we're really looking closely at the investigation and we're not going to let it go just because it was a couple weeks ago and other people reported on it. There's a lot more to say. And I think we need to hold people accountable. Um, we have tons of talks and lectures and things. The site was all designed with a robust AI model. So it learns as you go through. It'll learn what level you are. It'll learn what your interests are. Um, so the more you're on there and the more you're playing with it, the more it's going to give you things that it thinks are useful to you. Uh, a lot of the really in-depth stuff that's more complex, we've created summaries of at an eighth grade level and then at a at like 11th grade level. So you can read those summaries if you're uncomfortable with the primary text, but you can also go into the primary text. So there's a ton on brokenscience.org for people who want to dig in more. Nice, nice. I will link to all that stuff in the show notes, guys. And definitely it was 100% yes from a thousand people. Emily needs to come back for round two. Thank you Thanks so much, much, Emily Kaplan. It's been an yeah. absolute pleasure. Thank you. All right. See you next time.